Uh, hi, folks. It's a concerned Dr. Miskoff. It is July 31st, 2020, about 4 p.m. and enjoying the rest of my, uh, my week off here um, away from uh, direct patient care. And uh, I'd like to use the share screen option again and, and go through an article today um, that was in Nature Magazine recently. Let's see if I can get that pulled up. Okay, here we go. And you can see it's entitled, uh, it was an accelerated article and is entitled SARS-CoV-2 Reactive T-Cells in Healthy Donors and Patients with COVID-19. Uh, this was accepted July 22nd, 2020. And you can see the primary author is Julian Braun. Uh, interesting article, what it's basically uh, saying in review of COVID-19 and the pandemic, obviously that the uh, range of clinical scenario can be from asymptomatic to full-blown respiratory failure as an introduction. But what they're really looking at is, is a, a T cell or what we call CD4, um, a response to the spike protein on COVID-19 in that they looked at both patients who had COVID-19 and those that uh, they refer to as healthy donors. And what they found is that 83% of patients with COVID-19 uh, did have, in fact, a detection of this um, uh, COV-2S or the spike reactive CD4 cells, uh, but yet 35% uh, of, uh, of these patients who apparently didn't have COVID-19, in fact, had that uh, uh, reactive uh, CD4 protein as well. Uh, I guess in order to understand this, it's, it's good to go back and review T cells. Uh, remember, a T cell is a type of lymphocyte. Uh, it develops and matures in the thymus gland. Remember, the thymus gland uh, regresses as we go from childhood to adult. Um, uh, but that's, in fact, where uh, the maturity occurs and that there are uh, CD4 cells as well as uh, CD8 cells, um, the CD8 cells being those cytotoxic or direct killers, if you will, the CD4 uh, being known as the helper cell, but it can help to, in fact, destroy uh, what you know would be a foreign antigen or protein that's presented, whether that be a virus or, or something else, a bacteria or, or anything else that could be construed as a foreign body or foreign protein. Um, so the idea here is that the CD8s and CD4s may work uh, together in the immune system to take out uh, things that are not recognized by the body. Um, looking at it again, uh, it gets a little bit more complex, but these CD4s will interact with these dendritic cells, and these dendritic cells help to present uh, the antigen um, to the Th helper cells. CD8s, um, a little bit different again, more uh, direct cytotoxic. Uh, um, you will uh, uh, find that they will class these MH2 or histocompatibility proteins, uh, the, the, the class 2 with the CD4 helper, and the class 1s uh, go with the CD8. But again, these are ways of, of presenting antigen to these different uh, immune lymphocytes, and then they can, um, uh, the CD4s will actually put out interleukins, as, as we've discussed in previous vlogs, interleukin-6 uh, being involved. Uh, obviously, we've talked about in earlier vlogs and how there are medications that we use once the cytokine storm kicks in, uh, such as tozolizumab or cerilumab, these anti-IL-6 uh, medications. Uh, but it, you know, it just gets more and more complex as you look up different diagrams on this. Again, the dendritic cell uh, being able to present uh, uh, to the, the CD4 in this case, and uh, different types of interleukins being involved here. You can see IL-6, but all different ones. And some of these may not be necessarily harmful interleukins, but in some cases helpful, uh, again, to take out and help the immune system uh, uh, recognize uh, foreign antigens or proteins and, and help hopefully destroy them. So kicking back to the article, um, you know, again, T cells were noted, uh, these reactive CD4 helper ones. Uh, what they did here is they investigated SARS-CoV-2, that spike, those spikes that are on the COVID or novel coronavirus, those reactive CD4 helper cells in peripheral blood of patients who, uh, with COVID-19 and those who were unexposed healthy donors, allegedly. Uh, they did detect it in 83% of the patients with COVID-19. It makes sense. Uh, I can't explain why the other 17% uh, you know, uh, were, were not detected. Um, I guess there is a probability that 
um, these patients, uh, the immune systems were not maybe uh, functioning at full capacity or uh, so somewhat immunosuppressed uh, or uh, maybe wore off uh, the immunity. It's, it's potentially uh, possible. But interestingly, 35% of these naive patients also had that S-reactive CD4 um, uh, uh, response. Uh, what's interesting is that it mentions here also that um, uh, it says the S-reactive T-cell lines generated from COVE-2 naive HD responded similarly to a C-terminal S of the human endemic, the other coronaviruses, so 229, uh, e in OC43. Well, listen, uh, this may be a big portion of the story as to why some patients get so sick and some patients don't. Uh, a cross reactivity may be occurring where patients who have had other common colds or other coronaviruses like the 229E OC43, remember there's a couple others on top of that, but are not known to be lethal in most cases. Um, uh, and, and remember, even COVID-19 is not lethal in most cases, but we're still seeing that older, higher risk population um, with a significant death rate. Um, we don't see death rates with uh, just common colds of, you know, even two, three, four, five, and, and up uh, closer to 10%, like we're seeing in some populations with COVID-19. But potentially uh, healthcare providers or others in, in exposed populations that are getting these other coronaviruses throughout their life may in fact have some sort of protection um, uh, as again, there could be this cross reactivity and uh, we are finding you know, 35% of these patients who apparently didn't have COVID-19 with these reactive CD4 T cells that we would normally see in those who had COVID-19. Uh, as time goes on, the hope here is that as more and more people are exposed to not only COVID-19, but other coronaviruses that maybe some sort of innate immunity uh, will, uh, is created. Um, and over time, hopefully that as we get uh, more keen on the treatments, and again, we talked last night about uh, in the vlog about those frontline or physicians that are calling themselves frontline uh, providers, um, you know, using hydroxychloroquine still, I, I believe that uh, more studies are needed in prophylaxis and not just the ones that are out there right now on clinicaltrials.gov, uh, but more that combine a cocktail of early medications, not just hydroxychloroquine, but maybe uh, a steroid, uh, such as a nebulized uh, budesonide, potentially uh, uh, adding zinc, potentially adding a macrolide antibiotic, as we've talked about azithro and clithro, of course, being cognizant of the combination. Uh, with hydroxychloroquine and potential risk, albeit small, uh, in those cardiovascular patients, um, uh, and, and zinc as a, as a supplement as well uh, to help with uh, uh, potentially slow down the replication or copying of the, of the virus. Uh, and then there may be a whole other plethora of, uh, of over-the-counter or potentially prescription medications. Will remdesivir be here in a pill form to take early on? Uh, uh, you know, how safe is it for somebody to take a zillion of these medicines at once? And how do we concoct uh, studies that I don't see yet um, uh, where we have, you know, different arms of, you know, again, hydroxychloroquine at different doses, potentially taken more chronically as a prophylaxis? Uh, is that possible? Should it be over the counter? A whole other uh, conversation. It is over the counter in many countries. Um, is it really as safe as aspirin and Tylenol, like the frontline doctor suggested? Um, you know, these are all questions that still need to be completely answered, although we do have decades of experience with, with this medication. But the idea here is that as immunity beefs up, as time goes on, as we reach more a closer number to herd immunity, uh, of course, we know the story about monoclonal antibodies and vaccines being developed, and then again, mastering more with clinical trials and research um, you know, the cocktail of early medications, when this all comes together, you know, can we in fact beat COVID-19 and can we beat it soon? Um, uh, this is all the question, but this is promising. This gives us some, you know, possible explanation as to why uh, some patients may be getting sicker than others, potentially the ones that are not getting as sick, um, that are uh, higher risk patients, the more obese and elderly, May have had other coronaviruses with some cross reactivity. 
and maybe those who are younger, thinner, less, uh, you know, uh, not having diabetes, hypertension, obesity, the, you know, the, the comorbid factors that they've listed, maybe those who are getting really sick have not had um, uh, other forms of coronavirus or cross-reactive uh, proteins. And, and, and again, uh, we described, that was described in this Nature article in the CD4 T helper uh, immune system. Um, maybe one, uh, again, piece of the puzzle to this, uh, to this, you know, terrible virus that we've seen so far, and hopefully, and I do believe, again, science will prevail. I'll, I'll do a vlog in the near future on going back to school, because I know that's a hot topic, and what my thoughts are, and maybe even later uh, tonight or tomorrow. Everybody have a great night. I hope that was helpful in review of uh, some of the things about T cell immunity and lymphocytes. Uh, and uh, how uh, it is being looked at uh, in patients who are COVID positive, recovered, and naive. And uh, we'll talk to you soon. Everybody have a great night.